Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, and uh, welcome to uh, uh, these uh, advances in perioperative care in thoracic surgery. Uh, I am Alex Brunelli uh, from Leeds, and I'm uh, co-chairing uh, this session uh, together with uh, uh, Mr. Shah um, and Dr. Fontaine and uh, Juliet King. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, uh, start the uh, series of lectures uh, uh, with um, uh, Dr. Linda Martin. Linda is an associate professor and thoracic surger, surgeon at the University of Virginia. And uh, she uh, leads the ERAS program uh, uh, there. And she's a, a world-renowned expert in uh, enhanced recovery after uh, thoracic surgery. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, uh, her talk. Linda. Good day. My name is Linda Martin. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of Virginia. My topic is opiate avoidance and enhanced recovery and the impact on lung cancer. These are my disclosures. My goals with this talk are to point out four ways that opioids affect lung cancer patients and the community, and to explore several ways that we can intervene on this problem. As thoracic surgeons, we are all too aware of this, that the most painful incision is thoracotomy, and it is the Achilles heel of our specialty. But sometimes we encounter big tumors that require big incisions. In the end, patients care more about being cured of their disease than the size of their incision, so we have to figure out how to compensate for this. Unfortunately, in our field, pain equates with opioid therapy, but this comes with well-known side effects, as you see here. This is the first reason that we can connect opioids with lung cancer patients. Unfortunately, those side effects are not just a nuisance, but they can create a real problem. From this SEER Medicare database review, patients who were chronic opioid users had a 6% mortality with lobectomy compared to 3% for patients who were not chronic opioid users. And furthermore, they had a higher readmission rate. So short-term effects of opioids on lung cancer outcomes are a real thing in terms of side effects, as well as this increased morbidity and mortality. In fact, uh, many of our patients become prolonged opioid users as a consequence of the surgery that we perform. And some people might even consider that as an addiction. It used to be something I didn't pay much attention to. I didn't really believe it was a factor. Uh, however, it's really been borne out in recent data that this is a real concern that we should be paying more attention to. If you compare the outcomes of typical resections such as colectomy, gallbladder surgery, and so forth, about 3% of those patients are still taking opioids 90 days later, but multiple recent papers have shown that up to 24% of patients are still taking opioids 90 days after their thoracic surgery. The third interplay between opioids and lung cancer patients is the flow of opioids into the com community. We send our patients home with large prescriptions because we think that we're doing the right thing by treating their pain. However, a lot of those opioids are not used by the patient but get diverted to other people in the community, whether it's family members, uh, cohabitants, friends, or people who just wander through the house for home repairs and steal the opioids. Either way, about 50% of the opioids that we prescribe to our patients are taken by other people. And it's time for us to take responsibility for our overprescribing, which has led to this opioid crisis and the second leading cause of death in the United States. The fourth reason is one that I think will surprise you. I was quite skeptical of this idea when I first heard about it. Uh, and this is coming from uh, quite a bit of research that's been uh, building up over the years. This is a comprehensive review that was just published last year that points out that there are now several lines of evidence suggesting that pain, systemic opioid exposure, and opioid receptor activity may be associated with worse outcomes uh, for cancer in humans. Mu opioid receptors are actually present on lung cancer cells, both in cell culture media as well as in vivo. And because of this finding, people have further studied that opioids actually stimulate proliferation, migration, and development of metastases. 
In fact, in humor, human lung cancer cell lines, there is a sevenfold increased uh, expression of mu opioid receptors. And furthermore, when you look at the patients who develop metastases compared to those who don't, there's a substantially higher rate of mu opioid over expression in the metastatic patients than the non-metastatic patients. Further data has shown that this involves the EGFR pathway as one of many pathways and that blocking this can mitigate the response. There have been studies looking at PET scans where instead of using FDG glucose or fluorodeoxyglucose, they use an opioid receptor as the target of the PET agent. And in fact, the tumors light up like crazy with these opioid receptors and blocking those receptors with something like naloxone actually decreases the standard uptake value. The paper I shared with you earlier that's the comprehensive review has begun to flesh out the cellular pathways for how opioids cause cancer progression. And many of these are very familiar from other oncogenic pathways. So opioids stimulate lung cancer in vitro. Does this translate from bench to bedside? Because I remained skeptical when I first started reading about this. One of the earliest publications came out in 2014, looking at a clinical aspect of this, and this came from Cedar sinai Medical Group, and they looked at patients who underwent curative intent lung cancer surgery, and they looked at those who had recurred and those who hadn't at the five-year mark. They went back to their original surgical hospitalization and looked at how much opioid use they had during their index hospitalization, and it was nearly twice as high in the patients who later developed recurrence as those who did not. So that was the beginning of some clinical evidence to suggest that this is a real factor. My team wanted to look at this and see if this played out in a database setting beyond a single institution. And so we studied a SEER Medicare database and looked at resected stages one through three patients that were in Medicare, which is one of the United States insurance coverage strategies for most patients over 65. And we stratified patients into three groups, those who were chronic users for whatever reason, back pain or what have you, they were taking the medicine well before their surgery, those who just used it around the time of their surgery in the normal fashion, and those who continued to take it more than 90 days postoperatively, essentially a new group that was addicted potentially. And we wanted to see how this impacted survival, if, if at all. So this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve and looking at those three different groups, you can see that the minimal users are the ones that used it just for a short time around surgery, had this red survival curve, and there was a substantial decrease in those chronic opioid users who came to the operating room already on opioids and those patients who became new addicts or new chronic opioid users as a consequence of their surgery had a substantially worse survival rate. We also then uh, did a multivariable analysis controlling for multiple other prognostic factors, including stage, including receipt of other therapies such as chemotherapy and radiation. And we found that uh, chronic opioid use as well as new prolonged opioid use or that new group of addicts uh, was an independent risk factor for death. Uh, so again, more data to support that this cellular basis of opioid and lung cancer interaction is actually playing out to a real clinical effect. Uh, we found in this analysis that as many as 24% of the patients who had previously been naive to opioids became dependent on them after their lung cancer surgery. Our group uh, has also looked at um, opioid use and how it interplays with the immune system and knowing that it has an immunosuppressive effect, did this have any interplay with immune therapy? And so my colleagues in medical oncology and I worked together to study a group of stage four lung cancer patients on checkpoint inhibitors and look at those who, look, who took high doses of opioids versus low doses of opioids or none. We compared their median survival and it was markedly reduced in the patients that were high users of opioids. This data is not yet published, it's under review, so I can't go into great detail, but I'll suffice it to say that there was a substantial effect in uh, survival with heavy opioid users, suggesting that it is interfacing with the immune or tumor um, microenvironment. So I gave you four reasons that opioids are bad. So what can we do about it? I think many of us are already on to a partial solution here. This is um, my work on implementing thoracic enhanced recovery. 
We published this in 2018 after presenting it at one of our regional meetings in 2017. And I'm gonna show you some updated data that includes subsequent years of our program. So now four and a half or five years of data after we started our program compared to the year before we initiated the program. So about 700 patients compared to the control group of 223 before we had enhanced recovery. And just focusing in on the opioid outcomes, there's many other outcomes related to this study, but the opioids alone, if we look at in blue, the patients who were before we started our enhanced recovery program, that's what our opioid use was for VATS and thoracotomy patients. And here's what it was for patients undergoing the enhanced recovery pathway. And you can see that there is a durable and substantial reduction in opioid use and morphine equivalence with the introduction of an enhanced recovery pathway. This was a 74% reduction in the VATS group and a 69% reduction in the thoracotomy group. Yet the pain control was not impacted. Here in blue is before enhanced recovery, the pain scores day by day, and this is it after introduction of enhanced recovery, subsequent years for VATS patients, and this is in the setting of 74% fewer opioids used. For our thoracotomy patients, again, in blue is before the intervention and the other bars are after the intervention. So with 69% less opioids, we had clinically unchanged and statistically insignificant differences in pain scores. So this is one very effective intervention. Uh, enhanced recovery is a great way to reduce opioids. It can, ERAS can erase the high rate of opioid use in thoracic patients. We're exploring whether this is a durable response after their discharge from the hospital. Our preliminary data would say yes, but we're still working on analyzing that data. So that's the first intervention we have to offer for this problem. Are there other ways that enhanced recovery might influence lung cancer outcomes? I think the answer is yes. As we all know, we want healthy patients as they come out of surgery so that they can go on to their other therapy. Surgery is often just one facet of a cancer patient's journey with their treatment. And if they don't come through their operation successfully and in good shape, they're not gonna be able to get their chemotherapy or radiation, or they may be delayed or have dose reductions. So it's critical that they come through their surgery in good condition, and we need to do everything we can to help with that. But does it actually affect their outcomes? Uh, for the first time, somebody proposed a qu new quality metric for cancer surgery, looking at this concept of riot or return to intended oncologic therapy. And this came from Tom Aloya and his partners in hepatobiliary surgery at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And the metrics that they used were the number of patients who were prescribed to have chemotherapy or radiation out of how many actually did get it, and then they also looked at the time interval between surgery and when they started that therapy. Was it on schedule? Did they have substantial delays? And when analyzing that, they found that yes, indeed, enhanced recovery did make a big difference in the speed to treatment and the compliance with the treatment. And when those things occurred, the patients who were able to riot or return to their intended oncologic therapy had a substantially better disease-free survival and overall survival. And that's logical, it makes sense, but it's nice to see data that actually substantiates it. The thoracic group at MD Anderson decided to look at this as well in a lung cancer population, and they chose patients that were either node positive or had large tumors over five centimeters, so there was a clear indication for adjuvant therapy. They looked at how these patients were treated in the context of enhanced recovery as it went from before the pathway developed to a transition period to a full-fledged program, which is in green. And you can see on this curve here how quickly they returned to a normal performance status, meaning they were ready to go on to other therapy. And you can see that with a full-fledged enhanced recovery program, the time and proportion of patients to good performance status was greatly better in the group compared to before there was enhanced recovery program. So did that translate to a difference in their treatment? In fact, it did. They found that in the past, only 40% of patients received all of the therapy that was prescribed, but with the advent of an enhanced recovery pathway, 62% received all doses that were prescribed postoperatively. Furthermore, the time from surgery to initiation of chemotherapy was initially 60 days as 
um, enhanced recovery was introduced, that dropped down to 40 days from surgery to uh, post-operative therapy. So the second intervention we can offer for this problem is to use an enhanced recovery pathway to allow for a faster, more complete recovery and earlier time and better compliance with other oncologic therapies. So the intervention is that you can riot with your enhanced recovery pathway, return to intended oncologic therapy. So finally, is there anything else that we can do to influence this interaction between opioids and lung cancer? And I'm gonna come back again to the review I mentioned earlier, uh, the publication in Pain in 2020. And this paper posits some different ways to provide interventions for this dynamic between opioids and lung cancer progression. And they suggest opioid sparing strategies. I think we're well on our way to that with our enhanced recovery pathways. But other things we need to really look into and push our colleagues to do is to expand our pharma capabilities for pain control. Opioids have too many problems and we've got to come up with more non-opioid strategies for managing pain. For us, we've used regional blocks and things, but there's still going to be chronic pain with cancer. And so other pharmacologic therapies need to be explored and invented. Another really exciting possibility is to take advantage of the ability to block opioids peripherally while maintaining a central nervous system effect. Pankaj Gupta, who is an oncologist at the University of Minnesota, has gone so far as to develop a randomized clinical trial to explore this. He wanted to know if you could block opioids peripherally and have an impact on cancer outcomes in stage four lung cancer patients. The idea was that pain leads to opioids, but if you can still get that central nervous system effect with opioids, but yet block it peripherally, maybe you could mitigate the side effects as well as potentially tumor progression using a selective peripheral opioid receptor antagonist and the agent he chose was naloxagol. The schema of his trial was to take stage four lung cancer patients and randomize them to two different doses of naloxagol and a placebo and then to follow their outcomes. His primary objective was to look at safety and feasibility, but secondarily, there were many other objectives. The one I'll highlight is the uh, exploration of whether naloxagol might be associated with a longer progression-free and overall survival in this group of stage four lung cancer patients. Unfortunately, this trial did not go to completion due to poor accrual, and I hope that there will be renewed interest in this line of investigation. I think it's highly important. Uh, but this is the third intervention we need to look at is can we block peripheral opioid receptors and influence cancer outcomes and also some of the other adverse effects of opi opioids. In fact, I think there may be a role for this in our enhanced recovery pathways because many of our patients suffer the consequences of nausea, constipation. And again, if there really is a stimulatory effect of opioids on cancer progression, we ought to look at how we can block that in our curative intent patients. So in summary, opioids affect lung cancer patients and our communities in many ways with short-term side effects, which also translate to higher perioperative complication rates, the risk of long-term addiction, which I thought was not consequential, but it is, it's up to 24%, the flow of opioids into the community and diversion of these drugs to unintended recipients, which has led to opioid overdoses and a real epidemic of problems. And then there's this mitogenic effect of, of opioids on lung cancer and an independent risk for worse survival. This is a hugely concerning problem that is understudied and underappreciated. Fortunately, we have some interventions that we may have already stumbled across. With enhanced recovery pathways, we're already reducing opioids by as much as 60 to 80 percent. We are influencing cancer outcomes in a positive way, potentially. This is still underexplored, but we're getting patients to their therapy faster and in a more complete fashion with a good enhanced recovery pathway. And finally, there may be ways to interrupt the activation of these uh, mitogenic effects of opioids by using peripheral opioid blockers. Thank you so much for your attention. I sure wish I was there in England with all of you. Maybe next year we'll do it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Martin, for that fascinating talk, uh, really thought-provoking. Um, 
we would like for the interest of timing to hold all the questions at the end in the Q&A session. So we'd be grateful if you could stay to the end of the presentation session, if that's at all possible. Um, I'd now like to introduce Professor Renee Peterson, known to many of us as an early adopter and a fantastic trainer and disseminator of uh, minimal access surgery, who's going to talk to us today about evidence-based chest drain management. Mm -hmm. Professor Peterson. Ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the SCTS, I would uh, like to thank for this uh, honorable invitation to uh, talk about the evidence behind a uh, chest drain management. My name is Rina Peterson. I'm a professor of cardiothoracic surgery and a thoracic surgeon at the Copenhagen University Hospital Rysopteide in Copenhagen, Denmark. These are my uh, disclosures. So the agenda for the talk today on chest drain management is considerations on the following topics. The amount of pleural uh, fluid uh, allowed um, for removing uh, chest drains, whether to apply uh, suction or no suction, evidence for digital uh, chest drainage system versus uh, traditional water seal systems and the number of chest drains needed after pulmonary surgery and are there uh, incidents where we can avoid uh, putting in chest drain at all. This is going to be the topics. So we start with fluid, fluid drainage. Um, we did this uh, study a couple of years ago, published this in the European Journal in 2000. Uh, 13, we looked at 622 consecutive uh, patients undergoing vasculectomies from 2009 to 2011. And we followed up uh, 30 days after the surgery uh, to count the number of uh, patients who needed a re intervention. This may have been a re admission or a Pluricentesis that could be referred to um, the surgery. And um, our conclusion was that it's safe um, with fluid up to 500 milliliters per day, as long as it's a serous fluid, it's not a bloody or a chyle fluid. And uh, probably we have been overestimating the importance of fluid within the thoracic cavity and maybe underestimated the absorption uh, uh, capacity of uh, the, the thoracic pleura uh, or the, the um, parietal pleura. Uh, the, there were 2.8% uh, of pleurocentesis and re-intervention and one complication to this was a pneumothorax after pleurocentesis. Recently, uh, a randomized control trial was done uh, addressing the same topics and um, so they randomized uh, 35 patients in a low uh, drainage fluid group and a high drainage fluid group. The low group uh, where uh, up to 200 milliliters uh, per day were accepted and uh, a high group where uh, up to 450 were accepted. There were no difference uh, between the two group and the conclusion was that the 550 milliliters per day is tolerable uh, and there were no uh, pleurocentesis or uh, interventions in, in either groups. Then we turn to the next, next topic, which is something that um, thoracic surgeons have been discussing for many years, uh, whether to apply suction or not to apply suction on chest drains, especially after uh, lobectomies. And um, this um, um, was a topic we addressed with a randomized control trial, which was published in the European Journal in 2018. Um, we randomized uh, 230 patients to either uh, no suction or suction. No suction was 
minus two on the topaz plus system uh, compared to minus 10, the suction group, which was our uh, standard uh, at that time. And as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis, uh, there is a significantly um, shorter uh, duration of air leak in the low suction group. This is the primary and secondary outcome of the studies with the minus two group to the left and the minus 10 group to the right. And you can see that the drainage duration was uh, 27 hours in the low suction group versus 47 hours in the high suction group. And this was statistically significant. Looking at prolonged air leak defined as more than five days, 14% had uh, air leak more than five days in the low suction group versus 24% in the high suction group but this was, uh, did not reach uh, statistical uh, significance. And further, uh, we can see that uh, we looked at uh, uh, the total drainage fluid and it was 566 milliliters in the low suction group versus 795 in the high suction group, which was uh, significant. So in conclusion, we recommend uh, based on this study, uh, to put um, on a routine patient um, the suction after that slipectomy on minus two. It shortened air leak duration, uh, it shortened drainage duration, and it reduced uh, fluid uh, production in this uh, randomized control trial. But how about the other trials? Are there agreement upon this strategy? Uh, recently, we published this the best uh, evidence topic in the Interactive Journal of uh, Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgery. Um, and we looked at uh, four randomized controlled trials that have been performed addressing this topic. So one of the studies was the study uh, that I just presented. This is two other studies from Peter Lick's group in uh, Odense. And uh, they came to um, a different uh, conclusion based on their two randomized controlled trials. They had 53 patients in each arm. And in one study, they looked at, at the, uh, the drainage volume and the other study, they looked at air leak. So duration of uh, drainage was uh, 25 hours in the low suction group and 28 in the high suction group. And the low suction group was defined as five centimeter water on the uh, topaz system, or, and the high suction group was defined as 20 centimeters of water. So no significant difference in duration of drainage. There was a significant difference in fluid output in favor of the low suction group, 330 80 milliliters versus 523 within the first 24 hours. There were no difference in uh, length of stay, but there was a significant higher amount of chest strain reinsertions uh, within the low shocks in group 13 versus 2%, and this was statistically significant. There were 8% uh, prolonged air leak in the low suction group and 7%, 13% uh, uh, in the high suction group, but this was not significant. The fourth study is by uh, Brunelli and uh, colleagues. This is a randomized controlled trial looking at 100 uh, patients having a thoracotomy and a lobectomy. The low suction group was defined as two centimeter water and the high suction group was uh, uh, clinically adapted uh, uh, to patients uh, at a regimen between 11 and 20 centimeters of water. Um, in this study, there were no significant difference on duration of drainage. Um, there were no difference, significant difference in total fluid output and um, prolonged air leak was also not significant between the three groups. So uh, based on this, uh, we conclude that um, there, there are uh, trials supporting uh, a low suction, but 
the evidence is not clear. How about digital drainage system? Well, digital drainage system have the advantages of a balanced suction. They're easy to read. It's easy for even an inexperienced nurse to see whether there was an air leak or not within the last 24 hours. This is another advantage. You can have the 24 hour registration of fluid and air. And if you have a patient who requires suction, maybe because of subcutaneous emphysema, you can mobilize the patient. So there are several obvious advantages of a digital chest drain system, but uh, does it um, really make a difference on the duration? Fairly, that's the question. And uh, this is the most recent systematic review and uh, meta-analysis. And uh, they looked at seven randomized control trials and um, several observational studies and concluded that the digital chest drain system is expected to benefit patients to attain faster recovery and a higher life quality as well as to reduce the risk of post-operative complications. But further RCTs with larger sample sizes are still needed to uh, clarify and elucidate the advantages of, of digital drainage system. How about the number of chest drains? Traditionally, I think that the majority of us was trained with putting in two chest drains after um, a lobectomy, one, a basal one for fluid and an anterior apical one for air. And I think this has been the standard in many units for many years. Um, but this um, trial was published in 2005, um, comparing, it's a randomized controlled trial comparing uh, one chest strain versus two chest strains uh, after a lobectomy or bilobectomy. And there were um, no difference and uh, no adverse um, events in the one drainage group. And so based on this, it's recommended only to use one chest strain is more economical and it's less painful for patients was the conclusion of this study. And I can say that we changed our uh, clinical algorithm based on this. And for the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've only been using one chest strain for uh, a standard vasculectomy. How about um, chest strains, avoiding chest strains? Is it always necessary to put in a chest strain? So we were inspired by the, the um, results we, we, or the observations from the uh, TOPAS systems that um, there was no air leak in a lot of these patients who had wedge resection after uh, a peripheral uh, metastasis. Uh, so we uh, uh, did this feasibility study on 50 patients and we had a very narrow inclusion criteria only looking at patients who had a wedge resection for peripheral tumor and uh, less than two separate, or less than or equal to separate wedge resections uh, with a tumor diameter less or equal two centimeters and only patients with an FU1 more than 60% or an FU1 FVC ratio more than 70% if there were adhesions or uh, corbular fatigue, um, uh, the patients received a chest strain. But uh, 50 consecutive patients um, were operated without uh, a chest strain. I, I must say that, of course, we did um, an intraoperative air leak, and if there was no air leak, uh, the chest strain uh, was avoided. And in these 50 uh, patients, they had uh, none of the patients needed to had, uh, have an, uh, a chest strain inserted in the postoperative course. Based on this, um, my PhD student, Lin, uh, he, he did this um, systematic review and, and meta-analysis looking at all the studies uh, uh, omitting chest drains after uh, BATS surgery. And um, there were um, four RCTs and uh, several observational studies included in this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis and based so uh, and based on, on, on this we, we concluded that 
omitting chest strains in selected patients after VATS seem effective, leading to enhanced recovery with shorter lengths of post-operative stay and less pain, but uh, with a higher risk of uh, drain insertion or thoracostentesis. However, a major part of the evidence comes from observational studies with high risk of bias. So further RCTs are needed to improve the current evidence. And based on this study, uh, we have applied the ethical committee um, uh, and sending the protocol for uh, a randomized control trial uh, after BATS retrosection using the inclusion criteria uh, in the feasibility study. So based on, on these data, I uh, conclude as we did in the recent guidelines for enhanced recovery after lung surgery, which was published in the European Journal in 2018 and led by Tim Batchelor from uh, Bristol and uh, looking at chest strain management, the routine application of external suction should be avoided. The evidence level is low, but the recommendation is strong. Digital drainage system reduces variability in decision making and should be used. Evidence level low, but recommendation strong. And chest tube should be removed even if the daily serious effusion in, is of high volume up to 450 milliliters can be accepted in 24 hours. Evidence level is moderate and recommendation strong. And a single chest tube should be used instead of two after anatomical lung resection. The evidence level is moderate and the recommendation is strong. And based on this uh, literature review, um, I stick, still stick uh, to these uh, conclusions that we did in, in, in the guidelines. And um, of course, I would like to say that these are for uh, routine patients, there may always be exceptions uh, uh, to the, the general application of chest strains, but this is where the evidence stands at the current moment. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a great pleasure and honor for me to, to participate in this uh, SCTS meeting, although I uh, truly look forward uh, to returning to face-to-face -face meetings. Thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, that that was excellent, uh, and uh, I do miss uh, the face-to-face -face meeting, uh, and I, hopefully we should be able to do that next year. But that was an excellent uh, evidence-based presentation on on a uh, on a on a day-to-day -day issue uh, with such a lot of variations. So it was quite uh, uh, quite good to hear the evidence uh, behind the, your current management strategy. Uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Rene, I'm, I'm grateful if you could stay on. Uh, because we're going to take the questions toward the end. Uh, so the next uh, colleague is is Tim Batchelor. Uh, Tim uh, Tim has uh, we, we worked together in in Leeds when we were co-registrars. Uh, he's uh, he's turned on to turned out to be amongst the leaders in in, in thoracic surgery and has driven uh, the initiation, development, uh, implementation. Uh, two international level guidelines in uh, in uh, enhanced recovery program after uh, thoracic surgery and he's going to talk tim is going to talk on what's more important individual eras elements or the whole uh, so tim thank you hello there my name is tim bachelor uh, I'm a thoracic surgeon from Bristol. I'm also the thoracic surgery lead for the ERAS Society. I'm going to talk today about what is more important, individual ERAS elements or the whole pathway. These are my uh, declarations. So uh, many of you familiar with ERAS will also be familiar with the concept of the aggregation of marginal gains. This was first popularized, of course, by uh, David Brailsford around 20 years ago when he took control of the British cycling team after an unsuccessful uh, Olympics. So his philosophy or the concept is that if you take whatever, whatever it takes to 
put someone on a bike and make them go very, very fast, you can actually break down that process into its component parts, uh, improve each part by 1%. And then when you put everything back to, together again, you have very meaningful uh, outcomes and differences. And so he achieved this with Team GB becoming the most successful national team at uh, all the Olympics since then. Uh, and of course, he went on to have great success in the Tour de France with uh, Team Sky. But perhaps the greatest sporting achievement of recent years uh, was uh, Eliud Kipchoge's breaking of the two hour mark uh, for a marathon. And yes, of course, it was organized and maybe slightly contrived, um, but still an amazing feat. There were multiple interventions of course, to optimize his running time on, the, on that autumn day. Um, the course was specially chosen. It was flat. Um, an optimum racing line was marked on the, on the road going around the corners at the end of the, uh, end of the course. There was also a laser on the road, which uh, acted as a, as, a, as a pacemaker. You can see he ran at the center of, a, uh, of a, an aerodynamic V-shape. Um, his co-runners were elite athletes who would um, come and go as they, uh, as they needed to. The weather was perfect. Uh, and of course he had specialist kit and shoes. So was this another example of the aggregation of marginal gains or did one intervention stand out above all others? So these are the guidelines for enhanced recovery after lung surgery. A lot of you will have seen them uh, already. And at first sight, they're quite daunting, aren't they? Because they uh, cover 21 sections and 45 individual ERAS care elements. And we're often asked, uh, are some elements more important than others or are there some interventions which actually stand out? And that wasn't the goal when we first uh, set out to uh, write these guidelines. In fact, the aims of the guidelines were to integrate existing knowledge into practice, to standardize perioperative care and to encourage research to address existing knowledge gaps. Uh, but the guidelines have been criticized and that's fair enough. Uh, this is a piece written by Rene Peterson, um, who is one of the guideline authors, of course, uh, and also Henrik Kellett, the um, godfather of en enhanced recovery. Uh, so two individuals who I respect enormously and have probably had the greatest influence on my clinical practice than any other individuals. Uh, and there's a few things that stand out from this editorial. They say, it is difficult for the busy clinician to interpret the many ERAS factors to be considered for improved implementation. Uh, and that's a reflection of the, yeah, the large number of ERAS elements that there are there. And they suggest that maybe we should concentrate on the key components for early recovery, such as VATS. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. So they say there are too many recommendations, and I agree that they probably are. They say that some evidence is just transferred from other specialties. In fact, about a third of the evidence is just transferred from uh, other specialties. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And we will talk a, in a, a little while about um, one of those components. Uh, they also say that some items are already standard of care, and I think that should be changed to some items should already be standard of care, because I've visited quite a lot of hospitals um, around Europe, and there are certain items uh, such as uh, SSI, preoperative um, optimization, um, fasting guidelines, uh, pain guidelines, which aren't uh, standard of care, but should be. And then they say a median length of stay of less than or equal to four days is common practice in many units where minimally invasive lung surgery is the standard of care. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because if you ask any thoracic surgeon what their average length of stay is, they'll say four days for a vats lobectomy. But the difference, the reality rather, is quite different. Uh, this is the uh, median length of stay data for England from 
uh, LCOP 2018, the data is crude and it's not corrected for case mix or pathology. Um, but we can see that actually the median length of stay is five days. The best performing units is for four days and the worst performing units is seven days. But the VATS rate is pretty good, isn't it? Around 70% for those four, five and six day uh, uh, units. And so you have to ask, is this variation, this 50% variation in length of stay, actually the result of um, differences in perioperative care? This is something that our Dutch colleagues asked. They um, looked at the mean length of stay for lung cancer surgery for every unit in, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands and found that there was wide variation. So whilst the mean length of stay was quite high at seven days, the best performing units were one and a half days less than that, and the worst performing units two and a half days more than that. And this data was corrected um, for uh, patient factors, for pathology, and for operative factors as well. They then went on to do the same piece of work, but this time just looking at fats, lung cancer surgery, and they found exactly the same thing, big variations in length of stay, and they concluded that the differences were due to variations in perioperative care. They then went one step further and sent out um, surveys uh, of ERAS adoption in all these different units. Remarkably, they had a 100% response rate. What they found was quite interesting. There was great variation in adoption of ERAS elements, um, particularly for day of surgery admission, fasting protocols, carbohydrate loading, and avoidance of preoperative anxiolytics. So all these things are in the preoperative phase and maybe um, not unsurprising as these elements are maybe uh, at a greater distance from surgeons and anaesthetists. Um, there is a lot of variation in the use of regional anaesthesia because th thoracic epidurals are still very common. And then again, not unsurprisingly, big variations in chest strain management because there's nothing that exercises a thoracic surgeon more than how to manage a chest strain. So again, back to what we, this talk is about, what is more important, individual ERAS elements on all the whole pathway, because this is something that's clearly important if you're wanting to adopt an ERAS program. Uh, this is actually not a, a new question and compliance with the pathway was first looked at um, by Olaf Gustafsson, who's a colorectal surgeon in Sweden. Uh, and uh, 10 years ago, he published uh, this data looking at compliance and how that relates to outcomes. And what they found was that if the more compliant you were with an ERAS pathway, then the better your outcomes were in terms of morbidity and in terms of readmission. And actually the sweet spot um, for compliance seemed to be around 70%. This was later confirmed um, by a big group uh, who were using the ERAS Society database. Uh, they looked at nearly 2,500 colorectal cancer resections and they found the same thing, that increasing ERAS compliance results in a reduced length of stay and reduced morbidity. But they also found that minimally invasive surgery was independently associated with reduced length of stay and morbidity as well. And then more than that, there are a number of other factors which were associated with better outcomes in one way or another. And that was carbohydrate loading, avoidance of epidural and restrictive perioperative IV fluids. So this led us to... Um, look at the same thing in, with our ERAS data. And uh, again, we came to the same conclusion. So in other words, um, in patients undergoing lung cancer surgery, the more compliant you were with our simplified ERAS pathway, um, the better your outcomes in terms of both morbidity and also um, your length of stay. So a delayed discharge here was defined as a length of stay greater than the median. Uh, Michel Gonzalez and his colleagues in uh, Lausanne, uh, which is a mature ERAS centre, did a very similar piece of work. They looked at 192 anatomical lung resections uh, and then divided them into two groups, depending on how compliant they were with their ERAS pathway. 
And so they had a low compliance group, in other words, uh, less than 75% compliant with the pathway and a high uh, compliance group. And again, they came to the same conclusions. There were fewer complications in the high compliance group and a lower rate of delayed discharge. But the interesting thing that both of our two groups have found is that there are actually some factors which are more important. In other words, they're independently associated with better outcomes. And those five factors are carbohydrate loading, uh, minimally invasive surgery or VATS, early mobilization, and early removal of chest strains, ideally by day two, early cessation of opioids. So let's have a look at these in a bit more detail. Carbohydrate loading then, the evidence comes from colorectal surgery, not from thoracic surgery. Um, although the data we've presented here uh, suggests a benefit in thoracic patients. It improves hydration and well-being. It reduces insulin resistance and the stress response to surgery. And it's also associated with a reduction in post-operative nausea and vomiting. It's a low-tech, cheap intervention. You can use this um, uh, this preparation here, or you can just go to the local supermarket and get something off the shelf. As long as it's a complex carbohydrate, that's what you need to ask before your surgery. Minimally invasive surgery, I think we now all know that VATS, it should be the standard of care, certainly for um, stage one lung cancer patients. It all was kicked off with this a uh, famous uh, randomized controlled trial from Peter Lick's group, the Ben Dixon paper, where they randomized 200 patients into having either a lobectomy via thoracotomy or lobectomy via VATS. And all the, although the outcomes were slightly contrived, um, they demonstrated less clinically relevant pain at a year and better quality of life as well. The Violet study, our own homegrown study, uh, has finished and will report uh, shortly, 500 patients randomized to uh, lobectomy via thoracotomy or lobectomy via VATS. Eric Lim presented the initial in hospital results um, in 2019, which showed that VATS was associated with less opioid use, less complications, a shorter length of stay, but no change in various uh, cancer quality metrics. So we should all be doing VAT surgery. What about early mobilization then? Not a great deal of evidence other than what we've just presented. This is a really nice piece of work from um, a group in the US. Uh, this is their ERAS protocol for thoracic surgery. It looks quite complicated. We're not going to go into this in great detail, but what I am gonna highlight, what we've marked in red is everything to do with mobilization. Uh, this is quite hardcore. So preoperative mobilization, um, so getting patients fit. And then in the, in the anesthetic care unit, so immediately after surgery, patients are expected to walk within an hour of their lobectomy. They're then expected to walk again to meet their family who come to the, um, uh, the recovery area. And then they have to walk back to the ward. And then once they get onto the ward, it's like a boot camp. They're made to walk and walk and walk. And this is what their um, sign on the wall says. Walk, 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 walk. And the uh, results are very impressive. Um, uh, 300 VATS lobectomy patients, very low length of stay and very low risk of pulmonary complications. Uh, this is um, uh, an intriguing, intriguing piece of work um, from Boston, uh, looking at using smartphones to um, uh, capture how much activity people do. We we're familiar with our health app on our smartphone, which uses the accelerometer to tell us what we've been up to. These are patients undergoing all sorts of cancer surgery, uh, and they've plotted um, their daily activity against what their baseline is in the post-operative period. Uh, in this side of the um, uh, graph, these are patients who had no post-operative event, uh, so they had a very high baseline uh, they had a very high uh, daily activity after their surgery, whereas those who did have a post-operative event had a low um, uh, daily activity after surgery. Now you can say, well, they've had a complication and that's why they're not being active, or maybe it's the other way around, they're not being active and that's why they've had a complication. We can't tell this from the 
um, from the data, but intriguing nonetheless. Chest strain management, Rena has already um, talked about this, uh, but why do we bother? We bother because drains are sore, drain pain, either in terms of musculoskeletal pain or neuropathic pain. There's a lot of evidence out there. Rene has presented it. You only need one drain. You don't need suction. Uh, digital drainage systems reduce into observer variability, and they also allow you to apply less suction uh, than a, a standard underwater seal um, uh, delivers. Uh, and you should also accept uh, high pleural fluid outputs. Your pleural space is very adept at managing large um, uh, volumes of pleural fluid. Opioid sparing analgesia. Uh, Linda, of course, has talked about this. Um, a standardized multimodal approach to pain relief is recommended. We should be aiming at reducing post-operative opioids for all the reasons that Linda has already told you. The synergistic effects uh, with everything that we give in terms of systemic analgesia, it should be paracetamol in combination with non-steroidals. That's what you should be going towards unless there are um, contraindications towards non-steroidals. Ketamine is a useful adjunct, particularly in young patients. Everyone has um, steroids because it reduces pain and nausea. Magnesium is a magic tonic that all our anaesthetists like to give. Um, gabapentin, I put in brackets, because although it is a key component of many uh, ERAS programs, um, it is still the subject of ongoing trials. This should be combined with regional anesthesia. I think we all give intercostal blocks, and that's normally in combination with a catheter, whether that be paravertebral, a wound catheter, or maybe an erector spinae or serratus anterior catheter. In the US, lots of interest in liposome will be pivocaine or long acting bupivacaine. We don't have access to that yet in the UK. Uh, Linda Martin's um, initial paper on ERAS was one of the first to show uh, reduced opioid usage in an ERAS pathway. This is post operative uh, morphine use in VAT surgery, pre ERAS, post ERAS, massive reduction, uh, and similarly in the thoracotomy group. Another really impressive paper from uh, Miami published recently looking at robotic surgery and thoracotomy. Um, pre-ERAS and post-ERAS. This is in-hospital pain, uh, and, and this is their uh, post-operative day. The blue uh, line is pre-ERAS, red line post-ERAS, big reductions in pain, uh, both for um, robotic and uh, open surgery. And then importantly, when you look at morphine use, um, bit less morphine use in hospital for VATs, not much change for thoracotomy, but when you look at the discharge, look at this massive drops in opioid use once you get home, and this has clear implications for a number of things, including the opioid pandemic. So here we, back, we are, back to Elua Chipkogi, um, and how did he achieve that sub two hour marathon? Was it the aggregation of marginal gains, or were there some things which were more important than others? Well, the answer is probably that both things are, are true. This is the Nike or Nike Vaporfly. Uh, it actually improves the average time of a three hour marathon runner by six minutes. That's massive. That's a mile on the road. It's doubtful that anything else, any other interventions had such an impact. So the aggregation of marginal gains is going on there in the background. So in summary, then implementing an ERAS program can seem daunting. Some criticisms of the ERAS guidelines are valid. Um, variations and outcomes remain, however. Increasing compliance with the ERAS pathways associated with better patient outcomes, and some ERAS elements appear to be more important than others. So just to finish then, I'm going to misquote George Orwell. So let's suppose George Orwell had been a thoracic surgeon interested in palliative care. Then he may have said, all ERAS elements are equal but some ERAS elements are more equal than others. Thank you very much. Eustace. Thank you for that, um, uh, Tim. Um, 
having gone to you know, very, um, always like can you speak having gone to the next uh, it's um bible talking about quality of life Well, thank you. I'm Bob Unaidu. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the Department of Thoracic Surgery in Birmingham. And we've had some great talks on how to improve the lung cancer surgery pathway. And I hope in the next 20 minutes or so to share a slightly different perspective. At the outset, uh, let me say I'm not a quality of life methodology expert, but like you, I'm a clinician who's focused on doing the best for my patients. So I'll tell you why I think it's important to have a patient-centric approach. We'll look at some key definitions, how we measure quality of life, embed it in practice, and some key findings following lung cancer surgery. That whilst ERAS improves uh, recovery, perhaps reduces length of stay, uh, patients do still have significant long-term symptoms. And the importance of measuring quality of life is not only the endpoint of ERAS, but actually it can be the driver because it helps you identify areas where we need to improve. And in a drive where we're trying to improve treatment rates for early lung cancer, perhaps competing with SABRE, understanding the uh, quality of life after surgery is Im very important in helping patients make a decision as to what treatment is best for them. Now, traditionally, we've been very focused on survival, but as cancer survival rates have improved, the focus has changed to survivorship and the after effects of treatment. When we consider outcome measures, we can, can look at performance, for example, six minute walk, clinician, such as uh, complication rate, or patient and observer reported, such as quality of life measures. And internationally, We've been trying to set standards for this so that we can compare institutions and different types of treatments. Using a Delphi method of consensus, a set of recommendations has been made on both case mix and outcomes for all patients and then for subgroups. So for example, in this case, for surgery, pulmonary function, for outcome measures, complication rates measured by the clavian dindo classification. And finally, for health-related quality of life using the EORTC QLQ C30 questionnaire. So what do we mean by quality of life? Well, if you look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, it's defined as the degree to which an individual is healthy, comfortable, and able to participate in or enjoy life events. Well, that sounds very subjective to a surgeon like me. And indeed, like beauty, it could be different for each person. It's also affected by a plethora of different factors, wealth, employment, religious beliefs, etc. So what we really are pertaining to is health-related quality of life, which is an assessment of how the individual's well-being may be affected over time by a disease and a disability. It can't be reported by an observer, and that's important because when you're pitching a tool, you need to take into the, the consideration the different perceptions of a symptom, perhaps, that a patient might have, such as pain. Pain can be both sharp but it can also be burning. If you only ask about sharp pain, you miss out the burning. Equally, it is multidimensional. It looks at the impact on emotional, social, and physical aspects of the individual's life. 
So it can't be measured by one question. And here a few definitions are, are helpful. So health is not just about mental and uh, not men merely the absence of disease, but complete physical, social, and mental well-being. Increasingly, a term of wellness has been is used. And working with health psychologists, I've realized this actually measures something different to the disease or the negative perspective. Health-related quality of life encompasses both negative and positive impact markers, but also the impact on living. And all of these are umbrellaed under patient reported outcome measures, which also includes simpler tools. We might just look at one symptom, for example, breathlessness. So using QLQC30 as an example, this is a 30 item cancer specific instrument with five functional domains, as well as two, qu two questions on global health. It includes symptom scales and uses Likert scales, which are then transformed into a scale from naught to 100. For the functional and global scales, the higher scores indicate a better level. For symptom scales, a higher score means worse symptoms. So it looks not just at, for example, in physical function, how long you can walk, but the impact of that on your day-to-day -day activities. Other considerations when taking a quality of life tool like this are the effects on the specific disease and also on the subpopulation, for example, the surgery group. It's really important that we are measuring the right thing for the patient. So within QLQ, there is a lung cancer module of 13 questions, which characterizes some of the most common symptoms such as cough and hemoptysis. It became apparent uh, as it was being used that it needed to be updated because it wasn't capturing the side effects or after effects of radiotherapy or surgery. And this led to the LC29 project. I'm just going to illustrate the sorts of steps that are involved in developing a quality of life measure. So first, they did a qualitative piece of work, finding out what were the relevant issues from patients. They then transformed this into issues into questionnaires and tested a wide range of these questions in a cohort of patients. Then having refined and reduced them, looked at how they perform psychometrically across multiple, multiple international cross-cultural settings. So when you look at the LC29, the questions around surgery, look at the wound, any issues around the wound, pain, and how it's affected day-to-day -day activity. Another thing is to consider the general principles when you look at quality of life measures. And it's important to understand what happens in your disease process. So how does quality of life progress after surgery and improve? Only if you understand that, you can then map an individual patient in that pathway, but also you can look at how your service is performing or any intervention that you apply. Another important point is that improvement in one domain should not be to the detriment of another. But what is a meaningful improvement? Is a one point improvement in a scale of zero to 100 important? Or is it a 10 point improvement? And this is a, an area for ongoing work internationally using an anchor based methodology. This is where you link particular domains to other variables known to be of clinical relevance. So in the setting of COPD, a four-point improvement in St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire is equivalent to a 40-meter increase in six-minute walk test. So for a number of areas, using a number of cancer areas, this has been defined, for example, here in head and neck, a four to 10-point improvement. 
similar sorts of studies have been done for ovarian melanoma and advanced uh, colorectal. And I suspect in the next few years, the work will be published for lung too. So I've described to you a specific questionnaire looking at cancer and then its bolt-on module for lung cancer. But there are other questionnaires, um, for example, FACT, which looks at the uh, four domains of physical, social, emotional, and functional well-being. The LCSS, which is, includes a patient and observer section, um, which evaluates, again, physical, mental, and social. And the point to make here is that there are studies which have compared the, these uh, tools. And of course, there are differences in signals between them. A relatively new methodology has been has evolved within NIH or the USA, where you tailor the tool from a bank of validated questionnaires using item response theory to adapt to the specific symptoms of a patient. Advantage being that it's web-based and can be linked to medical records. General measures, general quality of life measures are also important. One of the most commonly used is SF36, which has been used in a wide range of medical conditions. And it also provides valid normative data from the general population to allow, to, allow you to make comparisons. EQ5D is also widely used and helps in health economic evaluation. And we have adapted EQ5D into our app, uh, which collects this at various time points within the uh, surgical pathway. So elements of self-care, usual activity, anxiety, depression, and pain, as well as a global health score. And I think this is one of the key things on how to embed PROMS into clinical practice. Electronic methods are the way forward. Another important point is to involve patients in deciding which are the most important outcomes for them. And for this particular app, Fit for Surgery, we, gave, we wanted to look at two areas. What was the most important clinical outcome? Was it complication rate or days at home within 30 days of surgery? Days at home incorporating not only length of stay, but also readmission and death. We also gave them a choice of two different questionnaires, quality of recovery 15, and QLQ C30 and asked them which better reflected, which were they more likely to fill in. The answers we got back were different to what we expected. We expected the patients would be more interested in days at home than complication rate, and we were wrong. Patients were more interested in whether they got a complication or not. We gave them the two questionnaires, quality of recovery 15, which is just 15 questions, and is very focused on recovery after surgery. It's been developed with that in mind. It covers all the main areas, as opposed to EORTC QLQ, which is defined more for a cancer pathway and is more holistic. But of course, there are a lot more questions. We were going to administer this questionnaire at least five times within the pathway, and we asked patients which they preferred. Interestingly, they felt that the QLQLC30 not only captured their experience of surgery better, but also they were more likely to complete it. So it's really important to ensure we get patient buy-in when we look at which measures to choose. And finally, in adoption of PROMS, integrating them into the pathway is, in my, in, in my opinion, critical. So we've developed this app, Fit for Surgery, which includes a prehabilitation, uh, exercises, nutritional intervention, and tailored health information. Uh, it uses behavioral chain methodology, things like goal setting to motivate the patient. Importantly, it incorporates the outcomes and baseline data collection within the app. And it uses that information to tailor it for the patient. So for example, here on the left, you can see patients have a visual analog scale where they measure their breathlessness. Depending on their level of breathlessness, the information videos on how to manage breathlessness will be displayed. When they're developing their exercise program, we have embedded a performance measure, a sit to stand fit test, 
that information with their Borg sense of breathlessness is used to help them and guide them on how to build their program, which, uh, which then em empowers them to, uh, for, for better compliance. And finally, we use the patient-generated subjective global assessment tool to define whether patients are low or high risk, and then based on that, define what intervention they get. And the same tool is used to assess their progress and improvement. So the final area that we're going to discuss are the effects of lung cancer surgery um, on quality of life. And Avina, one of the registrars, is presenting this in a lot more detail in a couple of days' time. Uh, but just to take a, a snapshot of some of the data from our own unit, over 10 years of 1,000 patients with a variety of operations, a reasonable VATS rate. And one of the key points to make here is that uh, global health status significantly worsens after surgery. And even five months after surgery does not completely recover. And this is true across physical, social, and role functioning domains. Similarly, dyspnea, fatigue, and pain significantly worse in, in the first six weeks after surgery and do not completely recover five months after surgery. So what are the determinants of patients who have a poorer quality of life? Well, the findings in the literature are a little bit inconsistent because of differences in methodology, and timing of, in, of the measurements, and size of studies too. The first three, age, current smoking, and pre-op lung function, I would say are, are more vague in terms of how they affect quality of life. But the extent of resection principally pneumonectomy, whether they receive adjuvant therapy and minimally invasive surgery, there's, the evidence is stronger. So this is the violet data, which compares open versus VATS lobectomy. And uh, Professor Lim presented this at, this year at ESMO. And this is from the abstract, that quality of life in terms of the pain elements are much better with VATS, even up to a year after surgery. In addition, there's improved functional recovery at five weeks. So, in summary, um, embedding PROMs into clinical pathways is important, can be aided by getting the patients to be involved, integrating them into the pathway, and electronic collection. They can aid in shared decision making, and importantly, they can help us define whether we have um, areas for further research and also look at the quality of the service we provide. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, uh, Professor Martin, Professor Deep, and uh, Dr. Nadu. Um, just a few questions coming through. Um, one from uh, Mr. Oman to um, Professor Peterson. Are there any situations where you'd advocate low suction and any situations where you'd advocate uh, high suction? Well, um, based, based on this randomized study we did in, in Copenhagen in our, in, in our setting. So our standard now is low suction for all patients who are having a VATS um, But if the patient experiences subcutaneous emphysema, the suction will be increased. Um, but I think based on what we learned from this trial that we, we are more cautious uh, increasing the suction for subcutaneous emphysema than we used to be. Um, so we will increase it gradually depending on the clinical situation. Um, but that, that's the, the most predominant reason for higher suction. You can occasionally apply higher suction if, if you, your patient is oozing in the recovery room a few hours after surgery. I occasionally 
use uh, increased suction to have a better uh, a visceral to parietal pleura uh, adaption. Uh, whether there's any evidence for the efficacy of this, I don't know. Uh, this this is based on um, clinical feelings, really. But um, but uh, of course, there's always um, how can you put it mass interpretation of a trial like this because uh, we use uh, low suction for all patients now. But actually, we don't have the evidence for that. We only have evidence from vasectomies, and that's I think is important to remember. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question for Mr. Bachelor, um, and that's uh, from Chris uh, Satter, who enjoyed your presentation like, like we all did. And is what's your comments on um, on um, sort of smoking uh, cessa uh, cessation and um, pulmonary optimization as part of uh, the ERAS program? Okay, thanks. So. Um two massive topics then, which we could have a conference on. Um, smoking cessation, um, yes, we know it's important uh, because smoking causes pulmonary complications, wound infections, and is implicated in reduced long-term cancer survival as well, of course. Initially, there was what was called the smoking paradox in that it was thought that if you stopped smoking and then operated on someone immediately afterwards, that they'd actually have a higher rate of pulmonary complications. And so some surgeons were advocating carrying on smoking through the perioperative period. Uh, we now know that's not true, and there seems to be a linear fall off in pulmonary complications the longer you get away from having stopped smoking. The real question is, if you take a bunch of smokers um, and subject them to a smoking cessation program, whether that be pharmacological or behavioral or whatever, um, does that translate into better clinical outcomes? And we don't know yet. We don't have the, uh, we don't have the evidence for that. In terms of prehab, um, you know, Babu, of course, is the expert on this, getting fit for surgery and prehab incorporates nutrition, fitness, smoking cessation, uh, education. We've got a lot of studies. They're heterogeneous. They often don't correlate the physiological improvements that we see in getting fit with surgery with clinical outcomes. There have been a couple of Cochrane reviews which have suggested that you have reduced, like to say, reduced pulmonary complications with prehab, but it's yet to be defined, I think, in who you are subject to prehab, uh, when you do it, what it looks like, and, and, and how long um, someone should be on a program for. Okay, thank you very much for that. A question to uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Nadu, that's from uh, Cecilia Pompili. An excellent presentation as usual, Babu. Um, as a member of the ERTC, LC29 and ESTS, Quality of Life Art Projects, I appreciate, appreciate the great advantages, response rates and compliance of the surgical specific items. Which time frames are you suggesting in your lung surgical clinical practice to symptom monitoring to reduce dropouts? You're on mute, Babu. Yeah, we can't hear you, Babu. I think you might be on mute. Uh, okay. Eustace, can I, uh, whilst Babu is getting yeah. his idea, can I ask a question to Linda, please? Linda, thank you. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of SETS to, to join and give a lovely presentation. Uh, can I just ask, uh, uh, what, do you have a feel or any data on how well uh, the Enhanced Recovery Program is is being implemented uh, across uh, across U.S. Or, or parts of the country? Uh, I think that's a great question. I know of programs that have a very similar setup to mine or that I actually learned from. And uh, part of the problem with this is the great variability of how we um, uh, implement the different aspects of the pathway as, as Tim Batchelor was talking about, that some people's version of enhanced recovery is very different than another programs. Um, and so some people are using little bits of it, but maybe not a focused pathway. I feel that we're going to need to get better definitions around this of what constitutes an enhanced recovery pathway and what does not. And I also think we're going to need to track this as we're comparing outcomes between VATS and open, VATS and robotics, all these other things. We really ought to be um, recording whether or not people are using an enhanced recovery pathway because in my experience, it really levels the playing field between the incision. The incision is irrelevant in my practice and it 
it shouldn't be coming into play in all of these quality measures. And also things like the violet trial, I wonder if we're tracking whether or not patients had their surgery on an ERAS pathway or not. So that's a long answer to a short question. It, there's great interest in it in the US. A lot of people have um, asked me a lot about how to do this. People are incorporating elements of it, but as far as who's doing a full-fledged, really comprehensive program, it's hard to know. Okay, thank you. I think I think we have the same issue at, in uh, in the UK. While there's clearly a lot of evidence uh, which we have heard and seen, uh, the implementation of it is quite challenging and had to have consistent, uh, you know, standards across the country. Uh, uh, Babu, please, can I ask? Uh, uh, you know, we've we've seen the app that you have developed in Birmingham, uh, and and the value of it in in engaging patients and getting. Uh, the data and, and patient experience at the back of it. Uh, again, Babu, do you do you see from SCTS perspective, we are keen to to uh, implement good practice and share good practice and facilitate good practice across the country. And how can we utilize you know this this model to disseminate uh, to disseminate uh, across the country? Uh, can you hear me now, Rajesh? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, just to first start off by uh, crediting Cecilia for her the work that she's done with the ORTC and the quality of life questionnaires. Um, we are, the, the first question that was about the time points are looking at baseline prehab before surgery, just at the time of discharge, one and six months after. Um, we can't afford to do 12 months. So, in terms of fit for surgery, we published the first piece of work. It's in now its second iteration, which uh, has now included nutrition, smoking cessation, and tailored information, as well as outcome measures, all embedded with behavioral interventions as well. So it's uh, to help motivate patients uh, at the moment. So we've developed that. We're testing it at the moment in a feasibility study, and we're waiting for funding from NIHR to see whether we get funding to study uh, and many of the centers on this call are, are going to be involved in that. If we don't get funding, we'll just implement it into real life. And people can access that. Um, so that's the plan. Thank you. And Babu, and, do you think the... Sorry, you used to say... Babu, uh, can, can, go on, is, go it, on is, is it possible to uh, do a quality of life... Uh, you know, questionnaire and use it uh, across uh, the various thoracic surgical units in the UK to get uh, a, a, a large data set on, uh, on, uh, on, you know, quality of life, which is a very important thing. Yeah, I mean, I think the Leeds group have done a lot of work on this already. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we need to work collectively across the country to actually put data together. Um, we we are still processing the thousand patients. We've got quality of life of data on, uh, but it's it's not an easy task. Um, but I think it needs to be embedded into into practice. The outcome measure, uh, so we shouldn't be just looking at length of stay anymore. Uh, this needs to be embedded within it. Can I just ask Linda a quick question? Is that all right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Linda, you were at AATS last week and you saw an intriguing paper presented by the group in New York about perioperative opioid use. Can you, would you br briefly summarize that and what your initial thoughts were on that? Yes. So this was uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering group talked about intraoperative opioid use and effects on genetic signatures and various pathways at the cellular level for lung cancers. And I think this is a great line of inquiry. However, in many people's experience, including ours, the intraoperative opioid exposure is minuscule. It's, you know, five morphine equivalents, if that, and most of it is occurring postoperatively or after discharge. So I think our efforts should be focused on looking at the interaction later, but it's I'm so glad to see that there's starting to be interest at this cellular level of opioids interacting with lung cancer and how that can be impactful. Um, so again, it's beginnings of some important research, but I think the focus might be slightly misplaced at the intraoperative setting rather than postoperative. Okay, I'm not sure if we've got time for another question, but um, uh, Professor Brunelli, if you could ask your question.
you're muted. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, can, can I ask a question to Rene, please? Uh, Rene, uh, should you should you put a drain or not to put a drain post pneumonectomy? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. It's it's depends how good a surgeon you are. <laughs> Well, as, as it is, we haven't put chest drains in for pneumonectomies in Denmark in the last 40 years. Um, but whether that's a good strategy or not, I'm not sure. I, I think we probably it's better to put in a chest drain for the first 24 hours. That's my personal opinion. <laughs> okay, now, so shall I, shall I ask you, uh, you, you not put a drain for 14 years or 15 years? And you said... 40, not... 40. Right. 40, 40, 40 years. Yeah. And, and you also made a comment that uh, uh, you don't think it's a good strategy. So uh, tell me now why you think in Copenhagen not putting a drain in, in, in pneumonectomy is not a good strategy. Because it's different. To, uh, it's difficult to, to monitor uh, the amount of bleeding. Um, so you, you can have a significant amount of bleeding in the, in, in the pneumonectomy <laughs> cavity without really discovering it. Uh, we use a very old-fashioned equipment where we apply suction to between uh, minus 5 and minus 10 um, um, uh, uh, on the side and on the back after extubation uh, to, uh, to assure that there is sufficient under pressure in the pleural cavity. But that's, that's been the routine. But having said that, you know, these days we, we do six, seven pneumonectomies per year so it's become now a, a rare procedure yeah. yeah okay i'm curious if in in europe you're having trouble we cannot get the balanced pneumonectomy drain systems the atrium systems they're just unavailable in the united states and so we either have to use a traditional pleurivac which creates too much negative pressure or nothing at all i don't know if you're having a shortage there as well Oh, we don't we don't use these atrium so I, I have no information about that and any other experiences on the atrium we we, we don't tend to use atrium do we uh, used us we don't no, we don't, no. okay. no, we don't. Any, any if there are no further questions it just uh, remains for us to thank the faculty, especially Linda and, and Rene and uh, the local, uh, you know, young colleagues. Uh, 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 so thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Okay, Thank you so much for joining us at SCDS. Thank and hopefully, you. Linda will see you next year. And, and Rene, we keep seeing you throughout the year, I think. <laughs> thank you. Thank thank you so much. Just to say, thank we perfect. need to remind yeah. people to uh, try and enter the quiz at the end of the uh, afternoon session. Reminder from Professor Curl Cup. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.